So, I'm going to be talking about staying motivated. As you can see, I look pretty motivated there. <laughs> and um, what is motivation to you guys? Any volunteers? What is motivation? Um, not to try to do something maybe. Um, I like that. Any, any, any other definitions? I'm sure you guys know. Willingness to achieve. Say that again? A willingness to achieve. A willingness to achieve. I like that answer. So, if we look on Google, um, the definition is a reason or reasons for acting or behaving in a particular way. So I just want you to bear that in mind when I'm talking about everything else. So, I'll talk a little bit about me, so you know who I am. So, I grew up in London, uh, in a small town called Roehampton. Not a very uh, inspiring place, a very sort of tight-knit community. Um, didn't really spend much time in Roehampton, but that's where I'm from, and I'm proud of it, I guess. You can see there, I graduated at Leicester University studying medical biochemistry. I graduated in 2012, and I'll be honest with you, um, I wasn't heavily motivated in my course. Uh, maybe I chose the wrong course. Initially, I wanted to actually study medicine. So, you know, I applied for university undergraduate got rejected everywhere, um, and then I got an alternative offer to do medical biochemistry at Leicester. So I said, yeah, why not, let me try it out. So my first year, they gave me the option to actually um, try and pass and get a certain grade, I think it was like 90% in sort of like all modules, and then I'd be sort of like given a ticket to go into medicine. I got like 83, 85%, so I didn't really, you know, embark on that opportunity. So after my time you know, at Leicester, I thought to myself, I, I really need to take this medicine thing really seriously if I, if I want to you know, achieve my goals and my ambitions. So I applied for something known as the GAMSAT. Horrible exam, six and a half hours. Not really sort of like medically related at all. They're testing so many different things. Um, they're testing your quantitative reasoning, um, you know, how you can analyze text, uh, how good you are at sort of constructing things together and a little bit of science here and there. Um, I took the exam four or five times, and it got to a point where I was like, do you know what, do I actually really want to do this thing? So I went back to my original motivations for wanting to do medicine. And it was to do with working with people, you know, a, a diverse range of socioeconomic people within the workplace and with patients. It was this sense of prestige, you know, I'm a doctor sort of thing. Um, there was this perceived sense of monetary value, you know, I'd, I'd be paid well. And there was also this sense of actually utilising uh, a sort of skill or interest that I like, which was science or biology. But then thinking about it hard, I thought, I don't know if, it, if this is for me. So during my time of sort of like dabbling between whether I should do medicine or not, I had this idea of actually pursuing a more sort of managerial route within NHS. I thought to myself, if I could get the clinical understanding and the managerial understanding, I could really position myself as someone as a strong and effective leader when it comes to communicating different things because working in the NHS, you'll realize that a lot of the issues that we have are determined and predicated upon poor communication. So then I set out uh, to work in the NHS. I actually started in 2010, just you know, agency work. Um, you know, doing basic administration, I was working for central bookings, I also worked in a maternity unit, um, and then there was an opportunity to actually work for service improvement. Um, so you can imagine a low grade sort of administrator going to a, a bit more senior position as a project manager. I thought, why not, you know, the opportunities there. Um, so luckily, I got the job, um, I actually met Margaret there, we worked together there for, for about well, I'm not sure how long you were there for, but for about six or nine months. I decided to stay there for about 12 months because I thought to myself, I've got nowhere to go back to. You know, it wasn't a situation where I was permanent in this administration job. I was working on agency. And this position that I had just got was a secondment. So my, my options were find a new job or hope that I would get an extension. So effectively what happened was um, I was offered an extension. But then I suffered with a really bad shoulder injury. They found a cyst in my shoulder. 
So the doctor was like, you know, we can keep the cyst in there or we can, we can get it removed. I was like, why am I keeping it in there for? I want it removed sort of thing. So they removed it and I was out of work for six months. Now, being out of work for six months with no money, it's not nice. <laughs> it's not easy at all. Um, you know, you have to find ways to, to either manage your money well or make money, obviously in a legal sense. Um, so the point being made is that really tested my uh, ability to be resilient and strong. You know, at the back of my mind, I wanted to try all these things, but I needed to stay focused on making money. And the only way I could make money properly was to find a new job. So after those six months, I actually landed a job in NHS England. Now, this job was slightly a step back because I started working as a finance officer. So I was responsible for paying all 1,400 GPs within London for all 14 immunizations uh, under a section called Section 7A, um, which was a great job. Quickly moved out of that and became a commissioning officer. And after that, I became a contracts and senior commissioning officer for NHS England. Uh, so my specific sort of expertise is uh, focusing on immunizations within the Northwest now, alongside that, I have managed very big procurements. Is anyone familiar with procurement? Yeah? Okay, more or less. Um, where effectively, we inject services into a population in order to increase uptake and um, health needs. So that was my journey within the NHS. It's been seven years. Um, I've enjoyed the journey, but what I have learned is that communication is the biggest issue, more so than anything. You know, they talk about you know, being in billions of pounds in debt, X, Y, and Z. But a lot of this comes down to making sure that leadership is on point, right processes are set in place, and communication is, is really at the key and the forefront of everything we do, from patient facing to, to, to back office as well. So, as uh, Margaret said, I published my first ever book, Understand, Reach, Expand, 15 Super Effective Ways to Manage Your Mind. And effectively, it's a self-help book really trying to mobilize one to overcome their fears and actually step into a place where they can actually achieve their goals. Okay, Sounds like a big claim. <laughs> but again, it, it gets you ticking and thinking about those different things. <coughs> now, I will be talking about the journey behind how I developed this book because it wasn't an easy one. And it required a lot of independent motivation in order for me to get from writing, or idea should I say, to finalizing a complete product. And lastly, you know, I hold um, different coaching sessions and mastermind groups, focusing on career development, uh, marketing and business as well. Um, really enjoy that, you know. Um, hopefully when it comes to sort of like a, a, a bigger stage in my life, I might sort of focus more on that and maybe do more sort of like consulting in the future. So simple process, but difficult to do. What does this mean? Well, to me, it means that if we have something that we want to achieve or do, the idea behind it is very simple, extremely simple. The process in terms of actually doing it is not so simple because it requires what? It requires motivation to do it. You know, behind anything that you do, you need to have some sort of internal voice or internal sort of push to allow you to get from A to B. And with this simple video that I'm going to show you, you'll realize that moods will go up and down all the time. Um, it's never a straight road, but with the right sort of tenacity and resilience, you can get to the end. This is me, by the way, not looking the same. <laughs> Okay, so the reason I did this video is because, let me, let me go a step back actually. I wrote the book because I wanted to stop people saying that it wasn't possible to create something, you know, especially on a low budget. Um, so I wanted to be in a position where I could manufacture, manufacture something and actually show people how to do it themselves. So in order to sort of provide evidence behind this, I filmed myself. It, it did feel a little bit pathetic at times, you know, talking to yourself and the camera and all that kind of jazz there. 
But when I actually showed this to people at an event, um, it really did invigorate some sort of inspiration because it allowed them to relate to the process. You know, they've gone through similar things themselves. Like, oh yeah, today, you know, I feel really motivated to do something. And then you're like, oh, I don't really feel like doing it. But when you get to this stage, you shouldn't allow this stage to sort of stop you from doing anything at all. So this is why I did it, just to prove that it can be done, but I do go through the same experiences that everyone else goes through. Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing great. Um, just want to do my third day of this challenge. And uh, my phone got stolen actually. So interesting day for me. But what I will say is that I've pretty much finished my plan. I managed to get two pages down, which is not on my target list. Um, but I think I was getting quite tired and that was my fault, I should have started quite early. Um, but it's exciting writing the book, I'll be honest with you. Today didn't really do much, I'll be honest with you. I did a page and a half, really disappointed. Um, I just wasn't feeling to write. So I didn't force myself, if anything. Hey everyone, just on the ninth day of the book challenge. Um, it's going well, today was very good. I think I was demotivated from yesterday, but today like banged out four or five pages, um, solid. Hey, so I did my book yesterday. I'm um, just doing a quick video for that. Didn't do much at all. Literally all I did was the title. Um, so yeah, just really needed to pick up the pace. I finished the first draft of my first ever book and I'm really excited. You know, it's taken me a long time to do. There's been hardships. I've had repetitive strain injury in my right hand. Just for writing the book, by the way. <laughs> I've also had, you know, cluster headaches and I've had my laptop that hasn't been working for four months. So effectively, I've had about six months of distractions potentially, but I was still able to finish the book. Now, writing a book is not easy, you know, but most things aren't easy that requires continuous habit, continuous effort, continuous energy, and continuous creativity and spirit. But just to the point that I have a full manuscript makes me happy and excited. You know, at the beginning of the year, in January, I said I wanted to write a book. I started writing, and now I have a complete manuscript. Okay, so that is a really shortened down version. Um, so I guess... I need to give you some context, okay? So I've always wanted to write a book, so to speak. And my first attempts was probably when I actually started writing, uh, working with uh, Margaret um, in St. George's. And I you know, started my first chapter and then I stopped. I just, it's like, this is long. <laughs> I can't be bothered to do this. You know, I'm working, I've got other stuff to, to think about. Um, I'll, I'll write a book later on. And then it was in 2015 where I really started sort of trying to take on all these different projects. Um, and I thought to myself, I need to find the focus. So I actually went to a seminar, a free seminar, which basically explained the structure behind actually writing a book. Very basic information, but it was enough for me to be propelled to do something about it. So in 2016, I said, I'm, I'm going to write. I'm actually going to write. This is, you know, amongst working a full nine to five. I wouldn't even say it was nine to five. I would say it's probably eight to six or seven. Um, you know, the majority of my book was written on my phone. So, like, I had all these different obstacles. I didn't have time on my side. But then the thing at the back of my mind was the fact that everyone has 24 hours in a day. If I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? It's that simple, you know. It's, it's reminding yourself of those situations that allow you to see that you do actually have the time and you can manage your time effectively. So before I go into the next part, what sort of things do you think I needed in order to be motivated to produce a book? <clears throat> what sort of traits or characteristics? Perseverance. Perseverance, yeah. Where do you think that comes from? It's getting a bit too deep, isn't it? <laughs> we'll hold that thought for now. Any other traits? Resilience. Resilience? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And what sort of, thing, sort of things do you think triggers those things? So, what, do you think, what do you guys think is the difference between we often hear people say, oh, you know, I should really write a book about it. I've had so many things really good from it. I should write a book about that. What's the difference between people who talk about that and somebody who actually goes and does it? And you think sometimes, well, if you've had this experience, you've read a novel, you pick it up at the airport, you go on holiday, you read it, and you go, geez, this is um, a pretty easy read. I could probably have written this myself. I probably could so what is it when we talk about those things sometimes, what is it that we are not doing? I'm sure you guys have the answers. So there's no, yeah, there's no right or wrong answer, just like it's true. Sometimes you don't know how to do it. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good start. You don't know how to do it. So, do you think that could be solved? <coughs> okay, so there's something about education, isn't there? There's something about information, or getting the right sort of information, to enable you to feel a sense of confidence to do something, I guess. Any other traits you can think of? Having the time, space, and support resources in place. 100%. So, you know, I'll give you a basic example. You know, if, you're, if let's say, for example, you want to start a business, okay? You don't need negative people around in your environment at all. You just don't. It just doesn't make sense. Even if that's a family member or a friend or whatever it is, you need to remove yourself, detach yourself, for that moment in time if you have to, in order for you to get the right sort of support, even if that is your own thoughts. So support is a big one. So we've got education, we've got support. Anything else? Exactly. Taking a risk. Taking a risk. What do you think about procrastination as well? Mm. The thing is, it is a lot about confidence and just you know saying yes, I'm going to go out there and do it. Even if you do have confidence and you keep giving yourself that internal dialogue, how do we get over procrastination? Because we all do it in our lives. I do it. We all do it, don't we? To a greater or lesser extent. <laughs> I think we all do that. <laughs> okay. So going on that point of procrastination, I guess two things come to mind, but one is a bit more dangerous than the other. So the first one is taking what you want to do very seriously like extremely seriously almost obsessive <laughs> you know um, and thinking about the consequences really of not doing it and I guess the second thing is creating the right sort of environment as well the reason why I think the environment one's a bit more dangerous is because sometimes we can get into this mindset of this needs to be right and I need this in place and you know all of this kind of stuff I do that a lot but that delays the process, you know. So yes, you do need some of that stuff, but you don't need to focus purely on that stuff. So this is what I've come up with. I know, he seems focused, doesn't he? <laughs> so the first thing is awareness. I think that you need to have a sense of understanding of your capabilities. You need to have a sense of value behind what you think you can give in a situation. You know, a perfect example of trying to establish this is a model known as the Jahari window. And effectively all that is, is basically picking uh, up to five to 10 meta emotions out of a list of 57 and choosing what you think identifies with you 
um, out of that list. So it could be confident, it could be intelligent, it could be insightful, whatever it is, whatever is in that list, you pick that out. So, um, so then you 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 do the same thing. You would you would actually go to like um, close friends or family members, someone preferably who's sort of like objective in nature, and get them to choose characteristics that they think embodies you as a person. Bearing in mind that you, you're not going to get angry or anything like that if they they choose what are perceived to be negative ones, but this is for learning purposes because you have a view and they have a view. And effectively, over time, you'll begin to see that certain characteristics may marry up. And if they do, you may be like, ah, oh, I, I do recognize this as a trait. Or you may be like, hmm, I'm, I'm not too sure if this makes sense. But you may want to experiment. So throughout you know, the years or times or whatever it is, your list of meta uh, emotions sorry, may change over time based on circumstances and situations. And new meta emotions may pop up. But there may be some that remain, okay, or stick. So this is a great way of understanding what sort of potential value that you bring into your experiences. So that's one way at least. But maintaining an understanding of what your value is, is very key, okay? I'm not talking about being egotistical, but I'm talking about an innate self-belief that you can achieve if you need to or if you want to. You have the power to do that. Second thing is desire. So, what is desire, guys? What, what is desire? What do people think desire is? It's just about how bad you want something. Yeah, effectively. How bad do you want it? So, there needs to be a focal point. There needs to be some sort of goal or achievement that you want that you, you, you would almost die for sort of thing. Okay, maybe that's extreme. But you really want it, you know? for whatever reason. And this normally comes back to knowing your reason why, as they say. This has been popularized in you know, uh, positive psychology and everything else. Knowing your reason why is what usually propels you. Then you can work out what. But knowing your reason why is very key because during the situations where you have to write this essay and you, you know, you've got 24 hours left but you've got 3,000 words to write, you need to understand what the ultimate vision is where you want to be in X amount of years' time or X amount of months' time. So being very clear of your reason why is important. What some people like to do is they like to develop mood boards or vision boards to sort of um, express their reason why. Maybe a digital copy or a physical copy. So it's always in their face reminding them daily of what they need to do. Sometimes people like to do affirmations, these are all different ways that suit different people, but you need to find a way to remind yourself of what it is that you really want to do. Okay? And did you ever think about things that you did want to do? So initially, you wanted to go into medicine and you really were desirous of that, but it turned out not to be something that was really going to suit you. Very good point. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we might, I might say that I really want to be an Olympic star, but that <coughs> might not Very good question. It's, it's weird because I actually imagined this question coming up. I don't know why, but I just did. Um, so if we go back to the whole medicine example, I was at a quite young age when I decided I wanted to do medicine. And I think I chose it because I, I thought in my mind that it ticked those four boxes that I spoke about earlier on. I didn't know what else I wanted to do. Um, wasn't really savvy in terms of understanding the sort of experience and description of the job roles. So I chose medicine because it seemed to align with what I thought I wanted. Now it's easy to say that retrospectively, but I guess I have the gift to saying that right now. So I guess when it comes to choosing what you want, 
when we get to the next steps, you need to see whether there is a sense of evidence base if that is possible. Okay? But it's up to you to decide how seriously you take that evidence base. Evidence base may come in the fact that somebody else has done it before. Like one person has done it before. That might be enough for you. For other people, it may be hundreds of people have done it before. So why can't I? That gives you more confidence that you can do it. There may be certain sort of common traits and characteristics that a specific successful person has that fits your description. Or maybe it doesn't fit yours at all. So you will be having these sort of judgments in your mind. Whether that comes at the desire stage or through the education stage, that's a different story, but it definitely does come. And at some point, you're, you're going to have to question yourself and say, is this realistic for me? I'm not talking about the outside world because that's a different sense of realism. Realistic in a sense of how you perceive it to be possible. So that's how I'd answer that question. yesterday was that Mike was teaching us that the biggest thing we got from the lesson from, from, from the study is that people react best, people are more motivated when they challenge themselves and I think that's pretty relatable to us, what um, Michael said because um, at the end of the day like you know, it's really easy to set yourself an objective which you know you've achieved but um, you're only really going to like develop as a person if you set an objective which you know you're going to have to really try hard and stretch to like uh, actually achieve it. So. Very good answer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I wholeheartedly <coughs> believe that. Um, I've forgotten the, the actual theory behind it, but it does talk about challenges and making a sort of like uh, um, goal sort of complex in a way, but not too complex and not too challenging. So you have to judge it the right way. You know, for some reason I thought writing a book was achievable. Don't ask me why, I just thought I did. <laughs> you know, and, and I tried it out. I wasn't scared to take that risk, so to speak. Um, but would I call it risk? No, I would call it an experiment, really. Different way of looking at it. So if we move on to the next stage, education. So uh, we spoke about sort of like educating yourself and getting the right sort of training and information base. Again, we all know that comes in different forms. Um, okay, bar this sort of uh, talk right now, you know, you have more formal academic sort of education that you can use uh, for later life. But obviously, we, we all have sort of informal forms of education as well. Um, that could be through experiences, that could be through things that we read in books or online, maybe even social media, <laughs> you know. But we have different ways of educating ourselves and we have to make judgments as to whether we find this information to be factual or not. Now, obviously, if there are some points of information that has, you know, strong institutions backed by it, or even sort of like a, a long-standing sort of organisation that, you know, talks about this stuff, then you are more likely to sort of submit to that information. But I would still say challenge it. You know, you, you have your own mind, you have your own thoughts, you own your body, so challenge the information that you have. And once you do have it, contextualise it in such a way to drive it towards what you need to do. So education is, is huge, but there are different forms of education, as you know. So then we have support. What forms of support do you think could help? Someone who's done it before. Someone who's done it before. Why is that important? It may seem obvious, but... <laughs> Something to follow. Exactly. 
You know, why try to reinvent the will when someone's done it already? You know, the, the great thing about creation or working towards anything is that you can learn from someone, but you can put your own spin on it as well. Just based on the fact that you are you. You're never ever going to produce something exactly the same. It's always going to have your own spin on it. So support is key. Mentorship is key. Lecturers are key. Um, coaches are key. Um, and these don't have to be sort of formal mentors and coaches because, again, from the space that I've come into, a lot of people are like, oh, you need a mentor, you need this, you need that. Well, I've come from the school of hard knocks, so I've had to use books, I've had to use YouTube, I've had to use friends around me who are working towards stuff. You have to be creative in terms of how you identify people as mentors and coaches, so to speak. But support is key. And surround, surrounding yourself in the right environment. And some people who just make the initial support um, here with your master's degree or your certificate, if you have family, sometimes, and, and you're responsible for others, your children or your elderly parents, whatever, but asking for support in terms of what your kids can do for you or what your own circle of, of family, whatever that makes up of family happens to be, to say, I can't do this because I really need to Support in the sense of carving out the time to be able to do what you need to do together. And in a work context, if it's my manager wants me to do this, or I have to go on a training session, what's the support? Can I organize your support? Can my line manager or matrix manager give support in some way to free up time in order for me to be able to do this thing that you're asking me to do? Which is a very good point, and I guess in that sort of situation, you have to be very good at uh, sort of people management or your emotional intelligence, um, knowing how to form the right sort of relationships to sort of flex those situations. Because if your emotional intelligence isn't sort of uh, good per se, and all of a sudden you're asking for these demands or what seem to be demands, you're going to be seen as someone who, who just wants something, you know. So forming the right sort of relationships is key to actually getting that support in the first place. So if we move on, planning and structure. So in the video, you would have seen me say, um, I think it was on day three, I've actually developed my plan. You can get from A to B without a plan. You can do it. Usually takes longer. Uh, usually there's a lot of heartache um, and usually a lot of energy spent. But with a plan and with some sort of structure, you're more likely to get there successfully. Um, are you guaranteed to get there? Nothing is ever guaranteed. Nothing is ever guaranteed. But in the education part, that's where you'll start learning about how to formulate your planning and structure in, in the right way. Um, basic ways to sort of plan stuff. I'm sure you guys have heard of this, smarter goals. So making things specific, measurable, achievable, relevant to what you're trying to achieve. Time bound, so, so setting a deadline. Thinking about your environment, <coughs> and also thinking about the risks as well. So being able to have that basic sort of objective uh, criteria is important when trying to develop any sort of plan. So that helps with the structure. And I would say, in addition to that, just write a simple tick list or action log or action plan. In other words, what do you need to do right now up until what you need to do in terms of achieving the goal? Very simple to do. And once you've done it, do it straight away. Don't procrastinate. Just do it straight away. And that really helped me. Again, you heard me talking about sort of like only writing a page and a half or writing a couple of whatever. Targets are key. My key performance indicators are key to helping me understand how well I've done. You know, how, how, how do you know that you've done something well? How do you know that? You need to compare it against something. So set targets, they can be small or big, but make sure you, you set targets nonetheless. Then we have implementation, that's just getting it done. I would say when it comes to implementation, 
think about what is required to help you continue to do what you're doing. So let's say, for example, we use that essay example um, for this purpose. Let's say you've got 3,000 words to write in, in, in five days, but you really don't want to do it. How do you think you're going to be motivated? What's going to help you to actually write that essay? What might help? What do people do, actually? So guilt, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so there's, there's that as an example. Anything else? Um, you can be um, motivated and really, uh, your video looks like you're quite isolated in those pictures. It looks like you're doing it on your own. Um, that you're doing something in addition on your own, something your internal drive is telling you you need to do and you need to achieve. But reflecting on things that I do, I, I need people on the journey with me and I need barriers removing or overcoming things <coughs> I so if I have a deadline in five days, I need to look at what that, the challenges are around me and I need people to help me, the, the support network, mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. Or you go alone and you're, you can almost tip yourself over to being unmotivated because the challenge is too much. It's too much. That's a good point. So having the right sort of people around you to enable you or push you to do that much more. A good show. I, I think that's a normal one actually, and I think that's one we underutilize. Um, don't be sort of a, a sort of misled by the fact I was by myself though. <laughs> Did you have like a whole support group here? <laughs> <laughs> Behind the camera, like, go on, Mike. <laughs> no, um, <coughs> but I would speak to people regularly, I would meet up with them, talk about progress and other stuff as well, just to get my mind off, you know, actually trying to sort of achieve this goal. It helps. Um, I would also listen to a lot of motivational, self-help, psychology-based books for many different reasons, but to remind me of what I'm capable of. It's coming back to embedding that awareness and desire. Because temporary defeats may make you feel like it's not possible, it's not capable, why am I wasting my time? But, you know, there's, there's something that a guy called Gary Vaynerchuk says, I'm not going to repeat it in the way he says it, because his language is quite bad. But he says, um, forget your emotions. Like, forget your emotions. Now, I'm not saying forget your emotions completely. You know, what makes us human is emotions and other stuff as well and our rational thinking. But when it comes to achieving something, sometimes you need to put your emotions aside. That is very difficult to do. To detach yourself and to say... I know I'm feeling rubbish today, but I'm going to place this over here. That helped me. That really did help me because I could then, at the back of my mind, on a subconscious and rational level, say, well, the consequences of not achieving this thing is not having a book and not having this and not having that, X, Y, and Z. So that helped me going. The only thing that changed was the deadline. So when I... So what happened was, when I started writing in January 2016, um, I thought I was going to complete a book in a month and a half. I know, funny, isn't it? So I actually completed the book uh, end of November. However, I realized I wrote way too much. So the book I had produced was actually 10 books, because I split each chapter into books. So effectively, I did write it in a month and a half, but my plan was jaded. Does that make sense? I still achieved what I needed to achieve, and more, but the deadline, so to speak, changed. But then you could argue, in the long term, I've, I've done this quicker, as opposed to spending you know, two or three more years writing the extra nine books. Yeah, I pretty much stuck to it. Um, I didn't change anything because I thought to myself, if I start changing things too early, I'm always going to be changing things. So the focus was, this literally was my strategy. 
I started <laughs> writing and I wouldn't look back. I wouldn't read what I've done, regardless of grammatical errors, X, Y, and Z, because I knew there was a plan to overcome that later on. So I just focused on writing. Then I did all of the checking and everything else, and then I checked it again, checked it again, got other people to check it as well. Stuck to the plan. The only thing that really changed was the deadline. So I think that's a really important idea to bring out, is that you just, you let yourself just write it, and didn't worry so much about the quality of it until afterwards. So I think that is where, I, from my own experience, that's where I get stuck, is because you think, oh, this is just totally rubbish. But as long as, long as there's something on the page, then at least you have something to correct. Exactly. And I guess this echoes um, something that Daniel Col uh, I think it's Goldman, talks about in the book Emotional Intelligence. And uh, effectively, he, he states that we all have this automatic servile mechanism within us, i.e., once you have the goal, you understand your reason why and everything else, the actual how is not as difficult as we think. So you need to trust that inner ability to do something as opposed to sort of like you know, focusing on the minutiae and trying to understand, like, how is there already? You know, like you said, you know, you can find the information if you need to and just get it done. But getting the initial stuff in terms of the awareness, the desire, everything else, I would say is more important than the how. Just get, just get it done and stick to the plan. So that Goldman book does relate specifically back to leadership styles and organizational climate and anybody's interested in that. G-O-L-E-M-A-N, so Daniel Goldman. He also has a Harvard Business Review article which kind of started the whole thing, which is um, the six styles of leadership and leadership that work, something along those lines. Um, and then his book about emotional intelligence. So that relates directly to leadership style and organizational climate. Great book. If, if you have the time and patience to read it. <laughs> so then, you definitely want to. So then the last thing is accountability. So how do you make yourself accountable? Do you publicly tell everyone that you're going to do something? And do you sink or swim? Do you have an accountability buddy or study buddy to sort of you know, coach each other. Um, what, what ways of accountabilities do you guys use? Just so I understand. Maybe for this course. I think the way you mentioned about having like dreams with someone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I would say the most powerful, the most powerful thing a person can use is other people. Okay, organizing your thoughts, organizing your actions, and your accountability around people, because people have the ability to inspire, invigorate the right sort of emotions, and coach you towards achieving a goal. Um, I do heavily believe in internal motivations, but I believe in intelligent internal motivation, if that makes sense. So being intelligent in such a way that you position yourself for success. And sometimes that means putting people or resources or tools or whatever it is to aid your development, to aid your progress. So that's what I'd say, accountability is key. So again, how does this apply to you? Because this is quite generic. It's pretty much what we discussed. But I will read it out. So be clear on your reason why you know, you're studying or working. Because I would say the sort of academic environment and the working environment is slightly different to writing a book, just slightly. Making sure you have a clear vision of what you want. So again, let's say you're working on a big project within the NHS and you want to procure a service, you need to be crystal clear of the benefits of what that service is going to deliver. Trust me, I know this, because if, if you're not clear, there's going to be 
a huge amount of maybe legal issues or communication issues or just poor stakeholder engagement that may destroy your reputation as a person and as an organization. You also need to be qualified for the role. So that may be in a form of experience, that may be in a form of education, that may be other forms of training. But the sort of education helps you with that confidence. And it gives other people confidence that you are competent for that position as well. So competency is, is key. Again, obviously we, we understand that we have you know, personal skills and values that we hold, but sometimes, or most of the time actually, it's good to have something on paper or on record to prove, so to speak, that you are competent. You also need to have a crystal clear game plan. So a plan is key in any sort of project that you're trying to endorse on, whether that's a personal one, a business one, or a career one. Because it then, it, it, it gives you that ease and it gives you that sort of assurance that, okay, I have something to work towards. I, I have something that I can use to help me move towards this goal. Associate with the motivated or motivators. So what this really means is just hang around with the, the right herd. Very simple. You know, if, uh, if, if, if four rotten apples are amongst one rotten apple, that one unrotten apple will become rotten. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a given. It's the same with human beings as well. So find people who are motivated or motivators because that will help you as well. Again, understand the consequences of your slack is important because if you have a clear understanding of what will happen if you don't do it, you're more likely going to do it. So in a way, fear is a motivator as well. You're just trying to use it to your advantage to get what you want, essentially. And the last thing is realizing that you're more in control in your life than you think. Okay, uh, we're not on the Truman Show. Um, we are more. <coughs> we have more power and control to respond how we wish to respond to a situation. And really, really understanding that to the core is pivotal to succeeding in anything. I'm not saying you can do anything. I'm not going to you know, tell you that here. But what I am saying is, if you have a specific goal in mind and you believe that you can do it, or you have some sort of belief that you can do it, then you have to understand that you have the power to control your results. Okay? Some people say, fail your way to excess. And, okay, no one's telling you to actually fail on purpose. But what that really means is your initial actions, your initial attempts are more likely than not going to be failures. Whether you use the word failures or not is, is irrelevant here. But that knowledge that you get, that information that you get, that experience that you get is key to making sure that you become even more successful than you even imagined. So realize that you're more in control than you think. And I want to leave you with this quote. So Victor E. Frankel wrote this book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's a, it's a short read. Um, if you listen to audiobooks, it's probably about four hours long. And he was a neuropsychologist who was taken to the concentration camps, camp, sorry, in Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, he basically wrote his experiences. And he saw his friends die. He saw people, he developed relationships die. Um, he went through extreme and dire conditions, but he still maintains his writing. And this is what he said. He said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Just want to break that down. So between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. So what he's saying is, there must, in fact, before I start, what do people think this means? Mm -hmm. and making a 
Exactly. And I think it's important to understand the word choice or choose, because it's not saying that once you choose the right response, everything will be rosy. It's not saying that. It says, once something happens in the outside world, there is a level of awareness that allows you to choose how you respond. It's almost like a, a, a moment of pausing and reflecting. And that response that you give, or those responses that you give over a certain amount of time, will determine your level of growth and freedom, so to speak. So this is the power I'm talking about. It's the power to choose. Some would argue it's the, the perceptive power to choose. <laughs> but that power is enough to steer your life in a direction that you are more likely want, wanting to go down. So that concludes my talk on staying motivated. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So I'm releasing my second book uh, in January 1st, well, hoping to be January 1st. It's called uh, Desire, the Cornerstone Between Nothing and Success. Um, I have other books lined up as well. Um, yeah, I just enjoy writing and just want to get my material out there. <coughs> I think when it comes to writing a book, um, I'd say it's more a, a great marketing tool as opposed to a way to make income. It's never a way to make income for me, even though it does generate some income. For me, it's more about marketing myself, but really about showing ideas and thoughts that I have. Um, I, I guess I seem to fancy myself to share my ideas, you know? Exactly. And I think I just learned and taught myself to not care about what people think, like be really aggressive with it, um, because if I start thinking about what other people think, that affects my sort of morale, my ability to achieve or, or actually do something. So I just, just don't care. <laughs> you know, if there's any sort of negative connotations coming my way, I literally just, I sever it. I just don't get involved at all. So there's this platform called Create Space. Um, they've partnered with Amazon, and it's a platform that allows any self-publishers to actually release their work, uh, fulfilling certain <coughs> criteria, um, and then it's up onto the marketplace. And then obviously you have to think about marketing and everything else. Um, so yeah, that's the basic process. Not difficult to do in, uh, at all. And I, I just want to show people it's not that difficult. Anyone could write a book. I really do believe that. It does it all. Writing, thinking, sequels to Fifty Shades of Grey. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what kind of class this is. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, again, this is this is a copy. It's a small book. It's just here. Um, designed it myself. Um, edited it myself, but got someone else to check it for me as well, who's a professional editor as well. Um, expenses were really low. Expenses were really low. And this was whilst I was working as well. So it, it can be done. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious about the change of self-identity you've gone through from wanting to be a doctor to now identifying yourself as a novelist or yep. um, mm -hmm. uh, inspirational speaker. Mm -hmm. So um, 
Can we talk through that process? How that felt? That's a very good question. So again, I, I, I told you how I grew up in a, a community that was very tight knit, and everyone knew me as the doctor, okay, so to speak. Um, and coming up, or being brought up in a very sort of traditional West African family, you know, they, they sort of say, my son's going to be a doctor sort of thing. Um, so I guess what happened is, once I went through the trials and tribulations of trying to get into medicine, I had to make a decision. And I thought to myself, do I actually want to do this? Or am I just doing this to keep up with the appearances or keep up with what people think I'm going to do? Is it something I actually want to do? So I, I really had to question what I wanted. That took a long time. Um, and I guess the biggest thing that I was scared of was actually telling people that, actually, I, I don't want to do medicine anymore. I'm not attracted to it. And there were so many things proving to me that I wasn't attracted to it. I'll give you an example. Again, working with Margaret in service improvement for St. George's doing project management. Um, I used to liaise and sort of like, um, uh, you know, hold meetings and stuff like that with different consultants and doctors. And I used to see what they, they, they go through. And I thought to myself, I don't want this for myself. This is not part of the criteria. Um, and there were so many other things that sort of proved to me that no, this is not actually what I want to do. So, I had, like, for me, if I'm going to stop doing something or not do something, I have to publicly do it and I have to make it a big deal. So, rather than sort of saying, yeah, I'm going to do the whole medicine thing, but sort of like brush it underneath the carpet, I was like, I'm not doing it. And I'll give them a full fledged explanation as to why I'm not doing it. Because I know it's, it's buried with, with that person. They, they don't need to ask me again. Do you think that moment where you owned your power and said, no, <coughs> mom, dad, auntie, uncle, whatever, I'm not doing it, mm -hmm. that's not me, I'm still a wise man, mm -hmm. but I'm going to, sorry. No, no, so, no it's true. <laughs> <laughs> what is wise? You know? Yeah, um, but I'm, you know, I'm going to express it this way. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was the moment that you kind of grew up and realised Santa Claus wasn't real? <laughs> I never thought Santa Claus was real, but anyway. Um, no, yes, I think so. I think that was the next step of my evolution towards uh, maturity. Can I say I'm completely mature? I don't believe anyone is, but I matured much more because I was claiming something that truly belongs to me as a person. And I think the hardest but most important thing that we need to do as human beings, I believe, is integrity, is to have integrity. And that means being honest with yourself and others. How you communicate that integrity and honesty is, is questionable, but I believe we need to be honest to ourselves. We have to be, because then what will happen is, let's say, for example, I was a, uh, I was a, a successful uh, sort of consultant cardiologist or whatever. Would I really be successful if I wasn't happy? You know, the thought of studying for five, six years, then doing foundation year one and two, then sort of doing my training for four to maybe eight or 16 years minimum as a surgeon. That sounds ludicrous to me. I, I want to live. I'm not saying, for the camera anyway, <laughs> you know, that you know, doctors don't have a life. That's their choice. But I have heard rumblings of some people who felt like they put themselves in that decision. I didn't want to do that. I really didn't want to do it. Everyone says How this. <laughs> Everyone says this. So, thank you for checking out my site. Uh, <laughs> so, so what I did one time, when I was getting very worn down, I said I, I don't want to continue like this, but I really enjoy what I'm doing. So, I actually sat down and I did this. I wrote down what I do, what I want to do, and what I need to do. And once I did that, I put that on a, a, a timetable for the week, so everything is scheduled. Like, I only meet people on Thursdays and Saturdays. No other day. I just don't do it, because what ends up happening is, oh, uh, do you want to meet up for coffee? Do you want to meet up for this? Do you want to, uh, all, all this kind of stuff? And you become this loose person, not really going anywhere. Then you look back and you're saying, I'm not achieving what I want to achieve. So I need to have a balance of that, but I also need to achieve what I'm doing. I also have 
you know, time out for myself on Sundays, I believe that's a day of rest, you know, to just relax, reflect, do what I need to do, and start the week again. So that's what's helped me keep extremely structured. It doesn't feel like I'm constrained because I've done it in such a way that it feels natural, and that's why I had to go through that process. Very good question. So I'll tell you the story before I answer the question. So I was working in central bookings for almost two years. I sort of developed this sort of, uh, I would say, quasi-leadership role, um, even though it was in a sort of uh, uh, administration position. And um, my attempt to sort of escape was to sort of network with different people. So I used to go to sort of, um, sort of meetings and events and all that kind of just there and I saw somebody I used to work with and they asked me how my job was and I said I don't like it I want to leave so they basically said to me that there is an opening for our position uh, for a position in our workplace so she said she was going to send me the sort of position she never sent it to me um, I, I found it online and uh, it was in terms of the banding I thought it was doable it was realistic so to speak you know, I wrote my sort of um, supporting letter and all that kind of jazz. Then something happened. Rather than staying at that banding, it went up by two bands, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> this, this is out of my league. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna apply for this. And it was speaking to my girlfriend, uh, where she was like, look, you've already started. You might as well continue. What have you got to actually lose? apart from, you know, the time that you spent writing this. I said, okay, fair enough. So I submitted the application, and I got an interview. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that is mad, you know. Um, so then I thought to myself, okay, I need to, I need to change the way I'm thinking here, because I went from being really sort of low and pessimistic about this, from actually being given an opportunity. So. I would say I'm, I'm an opportunist, uh, opportunist, so to speak. So I really, 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 really prepared for this interview. You know, um, I remember speaking to one of our managers at one time just to feel out what they're like and get their vibe sort of thing. And, you know, I used to, um, I, I actually sort of read their uh, service specification, their website inside out, their business plan, what they're trying to do in terms of the wider sort of uh, structure of the NHS. All of that kind of stuff to really get a strong understanding to understand their language. Then I applied and did pretty well in an interview and, and, and they gave me the job. But the point being made is the opportunity was what? No, it's two things. First thing is stepping into a space where I created that opportunity, i.e. writing that, 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 that um, cover letter and then realizing that I actually have an opportunity and embarking on it and, and really trying to prepare myself for it. So sometimes stepping into the room is, is all you need to do. Sometimes that's all it is. Hope that answers the question. Okay, I know it's quite complicated. If, if you're particularly interested in project management, you really have to think about this. What are the skills of an admin person that also match up with a project management skill? Yeah. Admin people actually have a lot of yeah. the same skills. It's the so same. Whatever the job is, what skills can I show that are, are the same as mm -hmm. I've already demonstrated? So up until this work, up when the biotechnology worked for in Manchester, um, we were doing clinical trials. So we, um, we were investigating a subcutaneous um, injection for a drug that would reduce scarring in surgery. So for those clinical trials, we needed a photographer to look at, um, you know, to, to have kind of before and after pictures and to document what was happening in the clinical trials. So when we went out to recruit for it, we got an application from someone who had worked for the police force. And initially the surgeon, who was the clinical director, had said, well, I'm not really sure, we really want somebody with a background in R&D, blah, 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 blah. And I said, but think about it. This guy's skills, what does he have? He has to take very specific pictures, he has to get good detail, and he has to document 
evidence because it's for the police. So he actually has all of the skills that you want. He might not be from the same industry, but what he does is exactly what you want. And we actually ended up hiring him and he was he was he was as good as he, he thought he would be at the job. So it's kind of looking at something and saying to yourself, what do I have that's within that, even though it doesn't look on the paper like I have that experience? That maybe this afternoon with career skills, you might want to ask the career skills you might have. And that that isn't don't don't mistaken that for lying, okay? Yes. Or, 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 or fabricating. There, there there is lying and fabrication, but there is knowing how to sort of like understand what transferable skills you have, and applying it into scenarios. That's what it is. And I guess again, if it's an interview sort of basis, you need to think about what common questions there are. For the two, it gives you confidence, I guess that you do know what you're talking about and what they saw on paper is exactly exactly what they're hearing. Anything else? Okay. I think that's it. <laughs>